Hopefully I'm live here. I think I should be. We'll start waiting to see who shows up as we continue in Genesis. Hello, Miss Cindy. Hello, Bobby Joe. Hi, Brian. Hi, Linda. How are we all doing today? Here we are to uh, somebody watches this recording, I guess, to our future overlords, the mole people, the lizard people. Good morning. This is Monday, July 13th, 2020. The year we want to forget. Um, registered for the virtual... I'm excited too, Gene, for the uh, for virtual conference. Um, it's lots of last-minute planning, because that's the way things work, is if you can make plans these days, boy, that's going to be... Uh, plans are, I guess, empty these days. But yeah, so excited about the... Uh, the virtual conference, yeah. Get registered, everyone, for the virtual conference. Lots of HT goodness coming straight at you. To your church, to your home, uh, to your computer, to your smart TV, to your phone. And also get the app then for your phone. So more HT goodness coming through in all those ways here in the next few months. Uh, next Over the next, well, just a couple weeks away now, aren't we? Where's the time gone? As slow as this year is going, suddenly it's it's more than halfway over. Anyway, um, we are in Genesis 14, um, half about halfway through that chapter. Um, we are talking about starting off with Melchizedek today. Um, so let's hop to it. Let me pull it up here. There we go. All right. After his return, that would be Abraham uh, from the defeat of Kedileomer and the kings who were with him. The king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. Uh, that is the king's valley. So here again, we're reminded about Abraham um, rescuing Lot. Um I think it, I called him a warlord um, the other the other day, which is true, though I guess we kind of have a negative connotation to that. But that's just the way things were back then. You, I mean, you just had to. You were um, sort of on your own, um, unless you were in a city or a king, or you know, here we had um, a league of kings, a confederacy of kings um, coming together four against five. Uh, but if you were just sort of on your own, you better have um, some fighting men with you. Um, how good or how trained they were, well, um, there's a different Hebrew word there, not mighty men of valor. But still, I mean, it's just, it's necessary. It would have been necessary for Abraham to protect not only himself, uh, but his wife. Um, and here, Lot, his 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 uh, family, um, and all the 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 possessions he had for the sake of his neighbor. Um, anyway, let's keep, so, uh, and Melchizedek, um, king of Salem, he, uh, brought out bread and, um, wine. He was priest to God most high, Elion, um, the exalted God. Um, so Salem here is most likely Jerusalem. Um, it just seems to fit if you're going to go with some of the other um, kind of what we know from Scripture. Uh, Salem here. Um, and, and even there you see part of the name. Jerus Jerusalem. So Salem, Jerusalem. Um, that's just what it was, was called back then. Names change. As we've noticed um, in, in the expedition that's laid out in, in Genesis 14 and 13, Moses lays out you know how it all goes down between those kings and in a lot of those place names there's a you know well that's this place um so there's just reference to that 
you know, over, you know, by the time Moses writes this, I mean, it could be a long time, uh, you know, six, 600 years, give or take. I'm, I'm not so good with dates, but, um, over that time, place names change. Um, anyway, so this king, he brings out oil and wine. So, or bread and wine, sorry. Um, so he brings this out to Abraham. That's what's going on here. Um, and what does this... Um, and he blessed him and said, Blessed, uh, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, uh, who possesses heaven and earth. Um, and blessed be God most high, um, who has uh, delivered your adversaries into your hand and is uh, given. Oh, and that's it. Okay, sorry. There's no there's no quotation marks in Hebrew. So sometimes it, you stumble out of a you stumble out of a quotation. Um, so here um, Melchizedek is doing his priestly duty. Um, so he's priest of God most high and Luther takes this Melchizedek um, to be Shem if I'm remembering my Luther Genesis lectures on this one um, so the the patriarchs are still you know that generation closer to the flood closer to the, the time of the flood lived longer than those after and so Luther takes that to be this that there's a preacher um, the Lord's message always has a preacher always has a messenger there's always a messenger to go with the lord's word and we always have to keep that in mind in the times where um it's not necessarily explicit it's assumed because there's more weighty evidence in the in the old testament scriptures and the new testament that there's a messenger either a divine messenger um, god himself or a spiritual messenger that would be an angel angel means messenger or a human messenger. So that, that's how the Lord does things. Um, and we'll see that when we get to Genesis chapter 15, but we're not there yet. Um, so it, this Melchizedek does his priestly duties, and then Abraham gives him a tenth of everything. Um, so there's a, a gift given from God Most High, and then that elicits, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, response, but I would just say it's fruit. So the blessing is given and fruit flows from that. Um, fruit of thanksgiving. Um, a tithe, that's where the word tithe comes from, is a tenth. Um, so what's going on here with Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek is, a, is an interesting figure. So he, he's priest of God Most High, and yet, well, we don't know anything about him. This is it. Um, and there's mention of him in Psalm 110 in the Old Testament, and that's it. Where in Psalm 110 it says, I have made you a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Um, and so there, that's tying to the Messiah in Psalm 110, tying to David, who is king and priest, which is what uh, Melchizedek is, right? He is king of Salem, Um and he's priest. So he's king and priest go together. And um, this would be another theme if you wanted to go throughout. Um, if you go through uh, the judges. Well, not, not necessarily the judges, but, but the kings and the prophets. You start seeing that um, these offices get coupled together. So... Solomon is a good example. Solomon dedicates the temple, and he does a lot of priestly duty. So he dedicates the temple. He does this, this magnificent prayer and lots of sacrifices. Um, there's certain priestly duties he can't do because the Lord lays out his gift giving. Um, so you have that, or you get David who prophesies, or Solomon prophesies, or Saul prophesies. Or you get Samuel, who's a judge, a, a foreshadowing of the kings. He also is a priest. He does sacrifices. He's of a, he's a Levite, so he, he does the, that. Um, he also prophesies. Um, so he's you start seeing these couplings together. 
Um, Moses is that way too. Uh, he would be sort of leader, king, uh, and prophet. And he does sacrifices because he's a Levite. Um, so, it, and, and Melchizedek here does that as well. Um, and the author of Hebrews, here we'll shoot over to that. Pull it up here. Hebrews 7 talks about Melchizedek. I wanted to read it. Uh, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham appointed a tenth part of everything. He, that's Melchizedek, is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Um, he is without father and mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. Um, let's see here. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about how you give t the person giving the offering gives to the greater one. And so the author of Hebrews wants to see a picture of Christ in this Melchizedek. Um, because uh, that's the, that, that's what it means that the Messiah will be after the order of Melchizedek, that his priestly nature is is different than Levi. It's not by birth. It's by something else. Um, and the Son of God is priest because he's the Son of God. Well, he's also king because he's the Son of God. And he's also prophet because, well, he is, as John would say, the Word of God. So all those things come together in Jesus. Okay. Take a water here. If there's any questions, pop them in. This is interactive. Don't let me just talk the whole time. Uh, as fun as that would be for me, because um, most pastors are we're like um, we're like performing. Well, I'd say clowns just to bother Pastor Borkhardt if he's watching because he doesn't like clowns. We were like performing monkeys, you know, you just sort of throw us a bone and we'll just start like stand in front of people and talk about Jesus. I'm like, okay, how long do I have? And then we'll go over time. That's usually how that goes. Anyway, um, so bring your questions if you have them. 14, uh, bread and wine. Uh, yes, um, we could we could go the to the sacrament there. Um, probably m more readily is, is referencing, um, the, uh, the Old Testament grain offerings and drink offerings, which do foreshadow that, but you don't want to, you don't want to jump, jump completely to the end of the story. There, there's a, there's a history there. Uh, and this would start us recognizing that the grain offerings and the drink offerings, um, are meant for the people and really... What's funny about that is is those drink offerings, a portion always goes to, uh, the drink offerings and the grain offerings always goes to the priests. Uh, and so here's a recognition uh, would be that Abraham is also priest. We see that because he builds altars, but this would be another recognition, um, a foreshadowing of what's coming in Leviticus. Um, a lot of what happens in Exodus and Leviticus um, in the ritual standpoint is sort of restoring what the patriarchs just did but that's a whole other bible study um and the king of sodom said to abram give me the persons but take the goods for yourself well there you go um i'll keep the slaves you can have the stuff great we just have to remember that uh, we don't want to uh we don't want to think that they had modern sensibilities back then they weren't like us um they were i mean kind of in a in a worldly sense savages in a spiritual sense well they're justified as much as we are and in fact um we have equal footing with them uh in in spiritual matters much like luther luther in sort of worldly matters is sort of um kind of a savage that's 500 some odd years ago uh, but spiritually, like he's he's quite advanced because that's how the spirit works. He bears that fruit out in many generations, in each generation. 
um, mining the scriptures and bearing fruit. Um, I mean, to be honest, I mean, looking at some of the turmoil today, we aren't much better than Abram like they were back then. Um, certain things are obviously off limits now, but um, which is a good thing. I'm not saying slavery is bad, um, but it's just sort of we just got to keep in mind completely different worldview uh, than ours when it comes to like worldly things. And we can definitely say like, that's probably not good and it isn't good. Um, so th about taking the stuff, what does Abram say? Abram said to the king of Solomon, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, um, God most high possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or any thing that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let uh, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. There's a there's a, actually a valley of Eshkol in... Um, I wonder if that's where he's from. Anyway... That's neither here nor there. Um, so here Abram is is trusting in the Lord. Here we see um, a confession of his faith um, that he's not going to take any spoils of war uh, because he wants um, his confession to be God has made me rich, not anybody else. It's all from the Lord, not from, from the people. Um, but, you know, I'll take... Um, you know, I'm not going to take from you. So whatever we ate, we'll take that. We'll take the provisions. So we'll, it all balances out. It's going to break even um, between Abraham and the king of Sodom. That's how that's how that, that goes. But if Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre want to take their share, well, let them. They can have just divide up mine amongst the one, two, three, four of you. Um. All right, let's get to the good stuff. 15. This was a, an Old Testament reading in the historic lectionary. Oh, was that a couple weeks ago? I want to say it was a couple weeks ago, but I can't remember. I'm about to go on vacation, so my brain is slowly becoming mush. I've sort of offloaded... Um, all the planned services over the next few weeks I'm taking a couple weeks vacation and then isolating so uh my brain is starting to shut down here anyway i believe it was a couple weeks ago uh so 15 1 after uh these things or these these matters happened um the the word of yahweh came to abram in a in a vision uh, to say, do not be afraid, Abraham. Um, I am your shield. Your reward uh, is very great, or your exceedingly great reward. Um, you can go either way in the Hebrew. So, and this is where we're going to camp for a little bit, at least however long a little bit is with me, I just, I fly. So, um, so the word of Yahweh comes to, to Abram and here, I'll make myself big. So it's, it's right here. The word of Yahweh came to Abraham, the Devar Yahweh, um, the Ramata. Hmm. Um, So the word of Yahweh comes to Abram. And we often take that to mean that like divine telepathy or something, like um, laser beam, like beam the message into Abram's brain. Um, or as he's just sort of standing around and like, oh, and he just has this sort of mental thing going on. Uh, and that's just, that's part of our worldview kind of coming in. That's how we think, because we, we're very internal. Um, in the same way, um, as an example of this, if you're reading about um, the Ethiopian eunuch, 
and Philip, uh, Pastor Philip in uh, Acts, is that Acts uh, 11, um, or is it 8, whichever, um, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scroll of Isaiah, and um, he would have been reading out loud, because we we read internally now, but back then they would have read out loud. And in the same way, we sort of import that understanding into what's going on here in this vision. It says vision. So he saw something and the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. And then he's talking with the Lord. So this is a very, um, um, what should I say? I don't want to say physical thing because it's a vision. Uh, but he's talking with the Lord, and not just the Lord, but the word of the Lord. So, because um, then, cause this is the thing, is it's not just a message that appears. Um, it's literally the word of the Lord, which is would be um, uh, Jesus. Jesus is the word of the Lord. Um, so here the Lord is his own messenger. The word of the Lord brings the message of the Lord. The word of the Lord speaks. Um, and we see this several times in the Old Testament. Um, and it's repeated here in this story uh, a couple times, maybe three. This word of, I can't remember. I glanced at it I read when I was studying. I'm trying to remember. Um, but we'll see. We'll find out together. Um, but the word of the Lord is Christ, is Jesus. The word of the flesh, the word of, and the, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word came to Abram in this vision and to say. So the word says, that's all talking about Christ Jesus. And he tells Abram, don't be afraid. I am the one who is your shield and your uh, reward is very great. Or is, it should, probably is, is very great instead of will be. Um, that's just how the, that's how Hebrew just works. Don't be afraid right now. I am your shield, and then you, your reward is very great. It's right now, because the, his reward is the Lord himself. Um, so this would be what I was talking about before, that the, word, the, the Lord's word always has a messenger. There's always someone to speak this word. Um, and so the times that it's a, there is none, well, we just we have to assume that because based on our experience of reading the rest of scripture, it's that the Lord either himself shows up or um, sends someone to speak his word. And so you, you either get an angel, you get like a Melchizedek or an Abraham um, or a Moses, or here the word of the Lord himself. The word himself comes um, to speak to Abram. And what is this conversation? We'll see that Abraham is a little bit perturbed at the Lord. Uh, but Abram said, O Lord, um, Yahweh, what will you give me? Uh, for I am going about childless. And um, the heir, the inheritor, the son of possession of my house, uh, it is the uh, Eliezer of Damascus. And it, so he's sort of like, well, how am I going to get this blessing? What does it matter? I'm childless. And Abraham continues. And by the way, it's sort of like, um, by the way, I'm not done. Um, and Abraham said, look, um, you've given me no seed. And behold, a son of my house uh, will inherit me. So... Um, uh, basically his he's going to have to name um, his slave his heir so here this is sort of an example for us for prayer we're very um, we like to be proper with the Lord and that's not to say we shouldn't be reverent um, but we don't really like to tell the Lord how it is like if we're praying We'll sort of keep those thoughts in our head, but we'll, we'll, what we'll express to the Lord is different. Um, Abraham doesn't quite do that, and the Psalms don't do that either. Um, in the Old Testament, if you've got a beef with the Lord, you'll tell the Lord to his face. You'll, you'll, 
Um, there's a reason it's called uh, Israel is called wrestling with God. That that often is is prayer in the Old Testament. It's like you're wrestling with God. That if you're mad at Him, you're gonna you're still holding on to Him, um, expecting a blessing, but you're gonna tell Him like it is, and you're gonna tell Him um, uh, what your beef is. So it's like, um, what are you gonna give me? I don't have a kid, and oh by the way, I don't have any seed. I don't have offspring. What are you talking about? And here it is. And behold, the word of the of Yahweh uh, came to him to say. So again, here it is. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him the second time. Um, and that this is a, a personal word, that this is a person of the Trinity, the Son of God, is this word of God. Um, you'll see this word of God coming to someone again um, in uh, the prophets. This turn of phrase comes up again later on. Um, and what does he say? What does the word say to Abram? Um, this one uh, will not possess for you or something like that, but um, the one who will come from you. He will uh, possess for you or from within you. Um, so it's not going to be this Eliezer. Someone else is going to, to come out from within you, uh, your seed. Uh, and then he brings him out uh, outside and says, please look at, consider, um the the heavens and count the stars if you're able to num to count them and he said to him thus will be your seed um so the lord brings him out and this look toward heaven um the hebrew word here um isn't the normal one to like see something with your eyes um, oftentimes this word has to do with um, with faith. So asking him to consider in terms of, of faith um, what you see. Eyes of faith here. Don't look with physical eyes, but eyes of faith, Abram. Um, so look out there with eyes of faith and number them. Well, okay, I don't understand this is what your seed will be like. Um, and here again, we start seeing that this seed is singular, one, and yet many at the same time. And this is fulfilled in holy baptism, uh, for Paul says, as many of us as were baptized into Christ were clothed with Christ, and so there's neither Jew, Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus. Your seeds of Abraham, offspring of Abraham. Um, and so we are one because of Christ, and that yet Christ is many because we all individually are in him, by faith in him, um, by being baptized into him. Um, and so we, uh, uh, these go together, faith and baptism, because we look at here this same Hebrew word, look toward heaven, look toward the font. It's the same way. Um, and the Lord tells you what the font is all about. Um, look toward, um, look toward this, 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 pastor, this man that I've put in your midst, um, and see what he has to proclaim to you, uh, the forgiveness of your sins, uh, the preaching of the gospel. Uh, look towards the bread and the wine. Look towards the altar and what's being given there. Um, there is uh, body and blood uh, for the forgiveness of your sins. Or to echo this this language here, you know, look with eyes of faith at the heaven and the um, the stars um, would be to quote uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 when he talks about the sacrament is look with eyes of faith at the uh, at the sacrament of the altar because there uh, though the grain was many now it is one and so we who are many are now one because we've all taken of the one body um, it's all it's all language that's related in the scriptures and what does Abraham do with this eyes of faith? What does the Lord's word do for Abraham? Um, and uh, he believed the Lord, 
Yes. Um, he was caused to trust in Yahweh. It's a passive idea. He believed here is is a, is is not something Abraham cooked up for himself. Um, here the um, it is all what the Lord worked in him. He drew this out of Abraham by the word of promise that he spoke, and Abraham then believes this Lord, and so then this belief, which is gift from the Lord, Lord. The Lord Yahweh uh, worked this in Abraham. And then what does the Lord do? He accounts this to Abraham, to him as righteousness. So um, Yahweh makes this promise about um, his seed, his offspring, the one yet many offspring that will come from him. And Abraham believes this word of Yahweh, this promise of this seed, this singular seed who will come. Um, and then the Lord counts, credits this to Abraham's account as righteous. So Abraham is not righteous based on what he's done, which we know, uh, from what Abraham did, um, in Egypt with Sarai, his wife, um, or kind of going to war, probably did some things there that, you know, happens in war. Um, can soldiers too be saved? Can an Abraham be saved? Can you be saved? Yes. Uh, because it's a matter of the Lord's word of promise, looking and seeing what he does for you uh, 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 in his things, in his in his gifts, in his. Um... And wait, there's more. The Lord likes to keep going, too. Um, and he said to him, um, I'm Yahweh, uh, which brought you up, caused you to come out. Uh, from Ur of the Chaldeans uh, to give to you this land um, so that you would possess it. Um, so the whole reason is to give this land and the land is tied to the Savior. Um, the, the Savior has to come from somewhere um, and the Lord has chosen this place uh, in his time, his way. He's running the show. 15.8. Uh, and uh, he said, um, uh, O Lord Yahweh, in what way am I to know that I am going to possess it? And he said to him, Take for me a heifer, three years old, and a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these and cut them in half and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Um... So here we got what a covenant is. Um, this is the way that covenants were set up in the, I mean, this is, we talk about a different kind of worldview. Um, we sign contracts now. Um, we'll sign a piece of paper with some ink. Uh, back then, um, they'd take some animals, cut them in two, and sort of make a path, and the people would walk through together with the understanding, if you break the agreement, you're going to end up like these animals. It's a little barbaric. Um, that's just the way things were back then. But it's sort of a big deal when you're making a covenant. This sort of legal, I guess for lack of a better word, legal deal. Um, you're going to cut animals in two and be like, yeah, don't mess it up because mm, it's not going to be good for you if you do. Um, and that's what happens here with Abram. So he does this, but what's going to happen? Well, here we go. This is the important piece right here. Um, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. Um, and uh, behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And uh, to Abraham... Uh, he said, 
Um, surely you you surely know. Uh, you shall surely know and understand, or to know you'll, you're gonna know for certain. You're gonna know no stuff. No, no, this. Um, that um, a sojourner, your your seed will be in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, and um, they will be afflicted four hundred years. Yes. Um, so. Right, let me do the right thing here. There we go. Um, so Abram has this this vision, and um, the uh, let's see if I can get it. Oh, uh, and he, the Lord, and it's it's not a good vision. It's not a good vision at all. Um, and this has to do with you know if we're going to think about how the story goes. It is because of um, uh, the, 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 the struggle that they're going to experience in Egypt. Um, I'm just looking up this word. I just Okay, that's the only place. I didn't want to bore you with me looking up something on the screen. I didn't want you to have like seizures or anything. Um, because of what's going to happen in Egypt. For 400 years, they're going to be in Egypt. Um, and indeed... I will bring, uh, I will judge that nation, I will bring judgment upon that nation. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. Um, you shall be buried um, with good gray hair. That's what's going to go on. Good old age. It's, it's good gray hair. You have lots of good gray hair. Uh, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the ini oh for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet oh complete oh that's not quite right um, uh, for not yet complete the completion um, of the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet up to here up to here. So where's here? Well, from the Lord's perspective, um, the iniquity has cried, has gone up to the heavens. Um, so that's a common language. So the Lord's speaking from his heavenly perspective. Well, and so why is it that the the Israelites, I, I got your question, Maggie, give me just a second. Um, why is it that the, the Israelites go to Egypt? Well, it's to be kept alive in a famine, um, but really... The thing behind the scenes here is that the Amorites are being handed over to their sin. And that would be Romans 1 language, that the Lord ha is handing them over. Um, so these Amorites, which is where Abraham is living and Abraham is preaching, and these Amorites are rejecting the Lord's preaching through Abraham. And so then the Lord takes his word away from the Amorites and hands them over to their iniquity. So that their iniquity would multiply such that they start sacrificing their own children. Um, that's where, like, if you're going to read into Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges, mostly Joshua and Deuteronomy, you find out that that's what the Amorites are doing. Completely handed over to their sin. Um, so that's what's going on uh, with the Amorites. Uh, how would you define covenant versus promise? Um, there's, they're, they're very s similar covenant would be a kind of a, um, a legal sort more legal term, uh, but generally the same. So the Lord will make a promise. Um, a covenant is just a really big promise with sort of, uh, possibly strings attached, usually strings attached. Uh, it just, uh, as we'll get here in just a second, we've got to, we got to read this last verse. Um, when it comes to some of the covenants, some of the promises, the strings are attached and it depends on who, who who's bearing the load. Uh, so when it comes to like a covenant, a big promise, when it comes to dwelling in the land, um, that's a big part of Deuteronomy. That's on the faithfulness of, of Israel. So you got to got to do these things and you'll keep the land. 
salvation promises and covenants. Um, salvation promises are always one-sided. Um, and so, and, and, and <laughs> at this early stage of the, of the promise giving, the covenant making, the land covenant and the salvation covenant are sort of intertwined. But as we move on from Abraham and into the children of Israel, you start seeing how it starts separating a little bit. And then we can sort of view them as distinct as the Lord's working out his, his promises for a savior that is unconditional and a land that is conditional. And, and the Lord throughout time starts separating these two. So we see clearly what's going on. So we're not confused, but you kind of have to know all the pieces of the puzzle to make sense of it. Um, it's because of the shedding of the blood. Um, kind of, but there's there's a new covenant where there... Um, I mean, covenants usually had shedding of blood, but there's still promises. I mean, if we want to tie it there, sure. It's just, it's just a different way of speaking. Um, you know, I, to put it this way, um, it's different um, if I promise to pay somebody back, just word of mouth, like I promise to do that. And there's a difference than if I signed a promissory note for a loan. Um, there are two different things. Um, and, and back then, well, they didn't have promissory notes. They had animals that they killed. Um, which of course, um, covenants always point forward to the death of the son of God, but we got to get there first. Where are we? Am I? Oh, I'm, I'm small. Okay. Uh, verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch went through, uh, between the pieces. And so who... When God makes this covenant to Abraham, who's on the docket? The Lord is alone. It's not Abraham. He, I mean, yeah, he, saw, he kills the animals and he's sort of sitting there. And what does he see? He doesn't pass through with the Lord. Only the Lord passes through. Uh, that was God. Yes. Yes, Brian. Uh, the Lord appears in two ways at the same time. Now, Abraham has a vision, is this is a dream, and dreams come from the spirit. The spirit is the one who gives dreams. We, we hear this from, from Joel, um, that um, I'll pour my spirit on them and they, the old men will dream dreams. Here, Abraham is an old man dreaming a dream, which means it's the spirit doing this. And in the spirit of this vision, then Abraham sees two things that represent the Lord passing through this, um, uh, passing through these animals. And so if we can do math and we understand the rest of scriptures, there's the spirit and two other things. That's three things representing the Lord all in one time. Um, this burning oven, uh, that, that is symbol of God's judgment, um, would be, uh, sort of a lot of language about that with, with God the Father, um, and here this burning torch um, would then be, uh, I'm not going to, if you want to, I'm sure somebody could find it, how to swap it the other way, that's fine. I'm, my, uh, would be the, would be the sun, the, the light of the world, the one who leads on the path, you need a torch to do that. Um, I'm sure so, some other pastor can find a way to make it the other way, that Jesus is the burning oven and the Father is the torch. Either way, it doesn't matter. Um, the point here is that we see the persons of the Trinity and the fact that the Lord himself is on the docket. So if the Lord can't go back on his promises because he would have to end up like the animals. And um, well, what if Abraham messes it up? Well, Abraham's not going to die. The Lord will die. That's how this covenant is working. That no matter who messes up the covenant, the Lord's on the docket. He's going to make payment. And that payment is his life. That's how that works. And you go, well, God can't die. Yes, he can. And he does in Jesus. And Abraham and Isaac and Jacob 
And all the, the other children of Israel mess this covenant up all the time. This salvation covenant, this covenant of your seed will be like the stars of the sky. That's the covenant that we're talking about here. And so it's all on the Lord. Um, he, this is a one-sided covenant. It's a, it's a, so if Abraham, God can't go back on it because God will die. And Abraham can go back on it and God will die. That's the sort of promise and covenant the Lord is setting up here. That he will bear the judgment. He will bear the wrath himself. And he does. That's ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, who, uh, who is uh, the light for our path. He is the path. He is the light. He's everything. Um, and he is the one who bears the judgment of the Father. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus. In Abraham's place, in Isaac's place, we're not there yet. Um, Jacob's place, your place, my place. The place of the whole world. Even for the Amorites. But the Amorites um, rejected the message that Abraham was preaching, the God that Abraham was preaching, the sort of God who um, promises a savior from sin. You don't have to work it out yourself. The type of God who um, will bear the iniquity of his own people. He doesn't tell you to figure it out. He'll figure it out for you. He's going to figure it out for Abraham. And that's what he's doing um, in all these stories to save Abraham and to save you and me. And with that, Oh, I was so close to finishing a chapter. Oh, man. So close. Um, well, we can finish it. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the great uh, river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Whew. So here there here we see just to finish it up is is the those two covenants sort of go together at this point where there's this promise of a seed who's savior and a promise for the land and as we pass through the time of the patriarchs to the time of the israelites coming out of egypt those um covenants are talked about in two different ways as we go through time as the time of the messiah comes closer the, the that one-sided covenant of salvation becomes clearer and clearer and clearer um, so that we would have, have hope. Anyway, with that, um, get signed up for the, um, the, uh, virtual conference. Um, get the, get the app, um, keep enjoying our great content that we're delivering to you and, 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 uh, hope it's a blessing to you. It's a blessing to me to work through the word. So it's my hope that it is for you as well. And with that, I hope you all have a good rest of your day.